more of your time, what I'd like to do is now introduce to you uh, Charles Arujo. Charles Arujo is uh, the founder and CEO of the IT Transformation Institute and author of Quantum Age of IT. Everything you know about IT is about to change. He's a recognized leader in uh, organizational transformation. He also sits on the board of uh, ITSMF USA and the executive of Next Practices Institute. He's a regular contributor to the CIO Insight mag magazine, has been quoted in things as, as uh, far apart as Business Edge and USA Today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Charles for a very interesting session. And uh, I'm sure we're going to take every bit of the 45 minutes. So please welcome Charles. Thank you all. Do we have, is it on? Thank you all very much. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you all today. I, um, it is great to, first of all, reconnect with some old friends that I've met over the years and also reconnect or, I guess, meet in the flesh a whole bunch of folks that I've only known through the social media world. And so it's always great to actually turn those virtual connections into real ones. And then beginning last night to actually meet a bunch of new people in this very vibrant service management community that you have here. And I'm excited to be with you. On a personal note, I, I, we've spent, my, my wife and son joined me on this trip, and we've spent the last several days driving around parts of Australia so far as, our, as we kind of worked our way here. And we've been truly taken by the beauty of this country and by the friendliness of the people, although I don't know that your countrymen appreciated my California driving skills that much. Uh, We've, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you all for the warm welcome. I should get my little clicker. So I want to start today by talking about a story. This is a story of the largest corporate failure that never occurred. This story is about Tom Ford Jr. and the utter collapse of IBM that didn't happen. So in the mid-1940s, IBM was already the largest manufacturer of business machines in the world. They were one of the largest industrial companies in the world, and they employed over 30,000 people. It was into that world that Tom Ford Jr., the son and heir apparent to Tom Ford Sr., the president of IBM, was trying to figure out what he was going to do with his life. Everyone, certainly his father, intended for him to take over IBM. He was not really sure that he was up to this task. And so he was so unsure, in fact, that in the 19, during World War II, he was working for Major General Bradley Follett. No, I got that wrong. Follett? No, whatever. I always mess up his name. But in either case, and he was serving as his pilot and aide. And he enjoyed that so much that he had decided that after the war, he was going to become a pilot for United Airlines. Upon hearing this, the Major General just made a kind of an offhand comment to him and said, really, I always thought that you'd go back and take over IBM. And Tom Ford Jr. was truly taken aback by this. This was a man that he trusted and respected, and he said, you really think I'm up to the task? And he said, of course you are. So, that caught, caused him to go back to IBM after the war and really set the course for what was going to come because in 1949, he made the pitch that would change not only his life, but I would argue all of our lives. During the 40s, during the war, IBM had actually made several investments in research around what would become the electronic computer. And in fact, had invested in the research team that created what most people consider the first electronic computer, computer created. But it was a different research team from a different university that created the foundational technology that would become the UNIVAC, the first commercial computer. That team approached Tom Watson Sr. and said, would you like to invest, take this technology? And he said no. And he didn't really think much of it. In fact, nobody did. Because even the most ardent supporters of this, this burgeoning industry really had no idea what they were dealing with. And so they passed. And everyone except Tom Ford Jr. didn't think anything of it. Tom Ford Jr. though said, no, this something is much bigger. And so in 1949, he made a pitch to his father. And I can only imagine this, just knowing my relationship with my father, how hard this must have been. He made a pitch to his father to say, we need to do this. We need to be in this business. 
And so they made some small investments, and they developed what would become IBM's first commercial computer. And based on its mild success, he then went back to his father within a couple of years and said, no, we need to be all in. And so IBM shifted a tremendous amount of their resources, a huge amount of their, their investment in research dollars, and actually went into the greatest amount of debt that IBM had ever been in up to that point. And but, but by 1955, IBM was the largest manufacturer of computers in the world. And as they say, the rest is history. See, Tom Ford Jr. was able to see that we were entering a different era and that that era was going to take a new type of leader to take us into it. And Tom Ford Jr., I think, thankfully for us, was that leader. But the parallel for us is that I believe we are entering a similar space and time as IT professionals. That we are entering a new era that is going to take a new kind of leader to lead us into it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I am a sucker for sappy chick flicks. I, what can I tell you? I have enough drama and reality in my life. I want a happy ending. One of my favorites is the movie While You Were Sleeping from the 90s with Sandra Bullock and Bill Pullman. And if you aren't familiar with the story, she, Sandra Bullock is a character who works at a train station and takes little train tokens. And this, this, in her mind, gorgeous guy comes to her every day and she's convinced that this is the one for her. One day he is mugged and left for dead as he rolls off onto the train tracks and she rescues him, which sets into motion an entire cascade of events where she, her, his family mistakes her for his fiance. And when he wakes up, his entire life has been transformed. Everything is different. And this is kind of our story, except that we weren't sleeping. Our world has been changing in front of us. Did you guys notice, by the way, that the background changed? Did anyone here? I'll prove it to you. It was blue. But it changed into orange as I was talking. This is what's happened to us. Over the last 10 years, our world has literally changed in front of our eyes. But because it has happened so slowly, most of us don't realize it. We don't see what has happened. In my book, I talk about three market forces that have changed the world of IT as we know it. And Shameless plug, you don't have to buy the book if you want all the details. But I will go through them very briefly. Those three market forces. First is the consumerization of IT. Over the last 10 years, starting with the rise of Google and the idea that suddenly we had a right to access information at a moment's notice. Now we have it on our phones and our iPads. I mean, I, on this trip we've taken over the last few days, the number of times we'd say, what about this, what about that? And out came the phones and we would be Googling something. Right? That began to shift the perception of how people expected access to information. And then you had something like Facebook and all the social media companies enter the scene. And suddenly this idea of interaction and collaboration became commonplace. And our corporate customers are sitting here and, wait a minute, but I can't tell what's going on in the next business unit down the street? That doesn't make any sense. And then we had the rise of Apple and those types of companies that change the way we actually interact with our technology. I have my iPad up here. I was sitting at a conference two years ago, maybe three, with a bunch of CIOs who swore iPads would never take root in corporate America. It's laughable now, but they were dead serious and they really thought they were right. And it's because it changed the way we expect to interact with our technology. So that consumerization of IT, as we call it now, set the stage that our customers' perception of how they expect to interact with not only their technology, but their service providers, was the first market force that started to change everything. At the same time, technology moved from the back office to the front office. When I started in technology, any of you that are a little bit older like me will remember this, Technology was all about automating accounts payable and, and back office stuff. It didn't touch the customer. Today, every single business process, every single customer transaction, every single element of the customer experience is powered by technology. And what that means is it leaves our customers deathly afraid because they're relying on this technology for everything that they do. And yet, they don't really understand it. And it's run by people they don't always trust because they don't always understand what we're saying. 
Now, we probably could have survived those two, frankly. But the third market force that rose over the last 10 years was kind of the thing that really shifted the game entirely. And that is what I call the competition for IT. The rise of cloud computing, software as a service providers, pick your acronym, pick your term, but it simply means that there are now a whole bunch of people that are providing technology to our customers that we were the only ones who could have provided it a few years ago. When Salesforce.com entered the scene in about the year 2000, 1999, 2000, frankly, they didn't even know what they were getting into. But it completely shifted everything. And so when you put those three market forces together, you find that while we were sleeping, our world changed. And so we are now in a position that we have to figure out what are we going to do next? How are we going to respond to this? This can be a little doom and gloom, and I don't want it to be, because the truth is, I actually find this to be a moment of great hope. In fact, the movie While You're Sleeping has one other piece to this. We'll let it tell it. So, I had planned to marry Peter, but I married Jack instead. Thank goodness my father was right. Life doesn't always turn out the way you plan. But Jack, Jack gave me the perfect gift, a stamp in my passport. He took me to Florence for our honeymoon. I guess you might say he gave me the world. Peter once asked me when it was that I fell in love with Jack, and I told him it was while you were sleeping. Okay, that really didn't have anything to do with it. I just love happy endings. <laughs> no, I mean, the truth is, that is that, that, that we... Your world may transform, but if you take it and don't try to fight it, if you allow it to go and allow, to go with, allow yourself to go with it, a happy ending comes at the end. But it does mean a couple things for us. First, it means that we're going to need a new type of IT organization to be relevant in this new world. And we are not going to get a new type of IT organization unless we have a new type of IT leader to take us there. And that's what we are really here to talk about. What does that mean? The first trick, though, is that in order to make that happen, we're going to have to be willing to let go of a few things. Because to some degree, in some cases a lot to a large degree, we are our own worst enemies. We've been trapped a little bit. I was talking to someone last night and said, you know, in many ways, while our technology has changed constantly, we as IT professionals, we as a profession, we as IT organizations have changed actually very little over the last 45 years. And so we have to get out of our own way. What would you get if you took a secret agent from the 60s, froze him, and thought him out for the 90s? It's freedom, baby, yeah! Austin Powers. Danger's my middle name. Secret. He's a swinger in a square world. A lot's changed since 1967. And a stranger. Bring on the sexy stews, man! We're called flight attendants now. In a strange land. Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. If we're not careful, we will be the Austin Powers of the future because we will be trapped in a world in which we think the old rules still apply. As we enter this new era, the old rules simply will no longer apply. In fact, there are four new rules for this new era that we need to understand. So I know I promised you four roles for the new IT leader. I'm actually, I'm like one of those late night infomercials, but wait, there's more. You're gonna get four new roles, four building blocks, and then four roles. So we're gonna walk through these. Here are the four roles for the new era, but before I actually bring up this first one, I have a question. Who here, and it's gonna be a little bit hard for me to see, who here considers themselves an IT manager? Okay, I'm going to say that's most of you, a lot of you. Okay, so here's the first rule. Stop managing. Start leading. Now, look, I know this was a bit of a sucker punch, right? I kind of, you know, I, I was trying to do this for effect a little bit, that, but the, there's a point here that we in IT tend to view our domain as management. We manage people. We manage organizations. We manage technology. We manage projects. 
And what my call to you today is that we need to start focusing less on the management aspects and start focusing much more on the leadership aspects. We need to see ourselves as leaders of people, leaders of the technology strategy, leaders of organizations, and leaders of projects. And that may sound like it's semantics, it's not. It is a huge shift in approach. And so we need to start by with that focus, and, and these reasons will become a little bit more clear here in a moment, but the big message here is that if you try to manage, you will be trying to hold on to sand. It will slip out of your fingers. The only option to you is to lead, and that means becoming what I call this new kind of IT leader. Here's a second rule, is that the idea of us as IT professionals managing and controlling our technology domains are pretty much gone. We have to see ourselves as managing complex ecosystems now. I would argue that within the next five years, 80% of all technology that is consumed by your enterprise is going to live outside of its walls. Maybe even more. And that's okay. But what we have to recognize is it means it changes the dynamic of how we operate. That we will no longer be working in this world or this paradigm where we've got this one-to-one -one relationships, where we can take our suppliers, our vendors, whatever you want to call them, and grind them down to get the low cost and then expect to have any shot at delivering the services that we need to provide to our customers. We will be working in these very complex interconnected webs where our suppliers will not only be providing services to us directly, but to our customers directly, to other members of this ecosystem, back and forth. It's funny, it's funny I was talking to a, a, a VP of a, not even really an outsourcing company, but uh, this new company, and I'm explaining this to him, and he said, you know, that's exactly what just happened. We just had a client bring us in, and our job is to sit there and help manage the relationships between all their other suppliers as they go back and forth, because these connections are just far too complex. So we need to start shifting our thinking into looking at the world in which we are operating as an ecosystem. And again, it's easy to take that as a word. It's much more complex than that because it means it shifts how, how we interact and the relationships we build. The third rule is that it's not about us. I didn't see Rob England this morning, but um, I, I'm... If, if he's here, I'm sure that he's sitting here going, it's never been about us. And that's absolutely the truth. But you know, the funny part is, is that for a long time, because we've had the stranglehold on technology, because we were the only one, only game in town, we could dictate to our customers, nope, sorry, that's not a standards, that doesn't meet our standard set, you can't buy that one. That was the whole thing with the iPad. Right? These CIOs thought that they could continue to control this. They thought that they could dictate that no iPads were not going to come in. They weren't secure. They, we couldn't control them. Guess what? Those executives said, forget that. I need this. And they went out and bought it with their own money, expensed it, and then walked in and demanded it get attached. So here's the deal. It's no longer about us. There is a new sheriff in town. And partners, it ain't us. Our customers are in complete control of everything going forward. And we're just going to have to come to terms with that. Google has a policy of basically that you've heard, you know, bring your own device, bring your own technology. They pretty much say, you know what, and I know they're Google, but they say, bring whatever you need to do your job. It'll be on us, IT, to figure out how to support that. Because the minute the technology and limits that we start putting on it get in the way, we become our own worst enemy and people start looking at how they can start getting around us. So it may have never been about us, but if you are holding on that you can still make it about us, it's over. And the fourth rule, and this one may be the hardest for you guys, is that it's going to be what you don't do that becomes most important. You will be defined by what businesses you are not in. You guys have heard probably there's been this kind of talk about the internet of things. I'm calling it now the internet of everything. Everything is getting connected. In a building like this, there is a good chance if it isn't now within the next five years that the lighting systems will all be automated. 
In buildings, you've got sprinkler systems that are connected now to the internet because they're monitoring weather forecasts and projecting when they're going to turn their sprinklers on or not. You name it, we are automating it, we are connecting it to the internet. And here's the challenge for us as IT professionals. If we think that we're going to control every last bit of technology within an enterprise, we're crazy. We, can't, we are buckling under the strain we have right now. There is no way that we will survive if we try to contain and manage all of this technology as it becomes truly ubiquitous. And so the trick, the rule, is going to be how you discern what businesses you are in. Which parts of the technology stack you are actually managing and controlling and those should be defined on only or by those technologies that are creating strategic value, competitive differentiation for your organization. That should be the business you're in. And so what we have to recognize is this isn't a one-size-fits-all. If your company runs a worldwide network of golf courses, then there's a pretty good chance you're going to want to control the technology that monitors how will they get watered because those greens are your lifeblood. They generate revenue and profit for you. But for most organizations, it's not strategic. So we're going to have to start getting very, very good at understanding where that value is derived from and understanding how to stay out of those businesses that do not provide value. And if you really think hard and fast about this, you're going to realize that you will not be in 80% of the businesses you're in right now. And I use those terms because we need to think in those terms. right? You are a service provider. You are providing a set of services to your customers, to your organizations. You need to look at each of those services as a line of business and start really hard looking at them and saying, should I be in this business? The gentleman that I had the opportunity to interview for my book by the name of Joe Pleasant, he's a CIO of a Fortune 500 company called Premier. He, uh, he does this every year. He goes through and evaluates, does a competitive analysis of every service that he provides to his customers compared to what they can buy in the open market. And when he finds that there is a, a service that he is not competitive in because it is either not strategic or he is simply too expensive, he exits that business. That's where our future is taking us. So the question for us is, well, then what does that look like? If this is who we are, then what does that future look like? I have a picture of what a new IT leader looks like. Would you like to see him? Maybe. Because we're all just going to just get out of this crazy business. They'll become chefs. That's what we're going to do. No. Why do I have a chef? So my wife, my son, and I consider ourselves as foodies. Is that a term you guys use here? Foodies? Yeah? OK. So, and I should qualify this, because there's, there's foodies and there's foodies. I'm the garden variety foodie, which basically means I like really good food, and I like eating a lot of it. My wife and son, on the other hand, they're more of the real foodie type. My son can tell you more about cheese than you ever want to know. I know because he has. My wife and son will go and have long conversations about balance and food pairings and flavor, I don't even, acidity, and I, I don't even understand it all. But it is fascinating because it has given us an opportunity to, as we go to restaurants and because we go to these nice restaurants, we always try to talk and meet the chefs and kind of learn. And it's really shed some light. And, and I'll explain here in a moment why I think that we as IT professionals can learn a lot from an executive type chef. So this is my wife and son. This is actually just Monday night in Melbourne. This is a guy by the name of uh, David Delia. He uh, is the executive chef at a, a great little restaurant called, called Il, Il uh, Bacaro, sorry, on Little Collins Street. Great little restaurant. And we had the chance to sit down and talk with him. And I'm going to reference him a few times here because I think that we're going to see a lot of the virtues that he has and some of the famous chefs that we know from TV as well, some of the other chefs that we've had the opportunity to get to know, provide a little bit of a roadmap for what the new IT leader needs to look like. So the very first thing is that an IT leader is a visionary. I'm sorry, an executive chef and therefore an IT leader it needs to be a visionary. Now, this sometimes gets confusing because I think we think in terms of visionaries as these big picture, big idea. But a, being a visionary simply means this. I have an image in my mind of what I'm trying to create. 
There's a show called MasterChef. I think there's a version here in Australia. We have one in the U.S. And the one in the U.S., there is three judges. One of them is the famous Gordon Ramsay. But one of the other judges is this guy named Joe, whose last name I can never pronounce. And he owns a string of restaurants. He's considered one of the foremost Italian chefs in the country and one of the foremost experts on Italian wine. And we had the opportunity, my wife and I, to visit his flagship restaurant called Il Posto in New York. And this was just a crazy experience. One of those places where the waiters have waiters and the food was just absolutely pristinely presented and it just had this elegant ambiance. They, after 14 courses, they brought us out after, and after two dessert courses, they brought us out, this thing looked like a, a jewelry box and they started unfolding it and inside were all these little dessert treats. I've never been so full in my life. And it's easy to say, well, you know, some hoity-toity dinner, of course. But what's interesting is Joe also has another restaurant right near our house in Southern California where we live called Mozo. And Mozo is a pizzeria. And it's the exact opposite. It is very casual. It is about the flavor of the pizza and the way they put it together. The point is, is that he had a very concise and specific vision for each of his restaurants. It wasn't just like whatever. It was created. As IT leaders, I think sometimes we fail on this. I think sometimes that we do not go into the business of delivering services to our customer with a clear and concise vision of who we are, the value we bring, and why anyone should care. So we have a lot to learn from this if we start approaching everything we do. Part of this conversation about getting out of businesses, you're not gonna be able to do that until you craft this vision. Until you have a clear understanding of who you are and what value you are bringing to your customers. The second thing that I think we can learn from executive chefs is this idea of being humble. Maybe, there we go. Now, if you've ever watched a show with Gordon Ramsay on it, you can sit here and go, um, Charlie, it seems to be a disconnect on this one. But what's funny about it is I actually don't think so. Because let's be clear, humble does not mean subservient. Humble means being of service. It means that we need to approach what we are doing with this idea that we are here to serve. Why does Gordon Ramsay go all berserk, other than the fact that it pumps up TV ratings, I suppose? Because he leaves it all on the plate. He wants to ensure that when someone is dining in his restaurant, that that experience is everything that he intended it to be. And there is a humility in that because it is not about him, it's about what he is serving. And I think we as IT professionals can get really hung up on this. Woe is me, how hard is it to do what I do and our customers just don't understand how tough it is. We need an attitude of humility, a servant's attitude where we view everything we do in the light of how we are serving our customers, on the experience we are creating for them. We need to learn how to leave it all on the plate. The third thing I think that we can learn from executive chefs is to be accountable. Ah, here we go. That, really, okay. That. If you look at the same movie, we stick with Gordon Ramsay on this, right? There was this one episode that he had to have his, the, the, the folks came, the, the contestants were cooking, and they, we show up, and they're at his restaurant. And it was very clear. You were putting food on plates in a restaurant that has my name on the door. He took it very personally. And it was from that sense of personal accountability that he then held everyone else accountable to it. Seth Godin, who writes a bunch of books, mostly in the kind of the marketing domain, but on business in general, talks about how, have you ever walked in one of these hotels and you're carrying all your luggage and you have to traipse all the way through this thing to get to the reception desk that's kind of hidden away in the corner? And it's like it makes no sense and you're kind of cursing in your breath as you get there? He says, what would happen if when you got there there was a placard on this, this hotel lobby design created by 
What happens if we start having this sense of personal accountability? How many times do we as IT professionals hide behind the anonymity of the IT organization? Instead of taking personal accountability for the service that we provide for every single interaction that we engage in. What would happen if that started to change? So we need to embrace the sense of accountability to be able to compete and be relevant as we enter this new era. And the fourth one, which you already saw, was to be personal. I'm going to give you two examples of this. First is there's a restaurant. We used to live in a town called Temecula, kind of Southern California wine country. And we haven't been there for about five years, or we haven't lived there for about five years, but we were there a couple months back, and we walk into one of our favorite restaurants called Gourmet Italia. And the owner of the restaurant, his name is Alex, and he walked up like we were long lost friends. Now, we were regulars. I think there's a good chance that he remembered us, but he sees hundreds of people every single night. But the point of it was, when you walked into this restaurant, you felt him. There was no doubt about it. There was this personal connection that was created. I think sometimes we want to take IT and mask it in this veneer of objectivity. And instead, we need to be creating this personal interaction, this personal experience. I was having lunch with a good friend of mine, VP of application development for a very large financial services firm. And as we were sitting there, a group of folks walked in and they kind of waved at him and he waved back. Towards the end of lunch, he called the waiter over and asked for the, their check. He said, I'd like to buy their lunch. As we were walking out, I said, so what was that? He goes, oh, well, they were, a, they were some members of my application quality testing team. And they've been working really hard on this project, and I just wanted to give him a little recognition. Now, he never acknowledged it. I'm sure they probably put two and two together. They probably figured it out. But this is a large organization. They were probably four levels below him. The salient point here is that, A, he knew who they were. He knew their names. He knew what they were working on. And he went out of the, his way to make a personal connection with them to say, I appreciate what you're doing. I think so many times... In IT organizations, we just don't do that. I once wrote a blog post about giving the IT wave, about the fact that we don't sometimes even acknowledge each other, to say, hey, we're in this together. We're on the same team. I love conferences like this because it allows us to come together and do some of that. But it seems like sometimes we go back to the office and we forget about it. So to be honest, these are not IT traits. These are four building blocks of leadership. If you can bring into yourself these four elements, that you see yourself as a visionary in whatever scope that is, that you bring this sense of humility, this sense of service into everything that you do, if you hold yourself accountable personally, first and foremost, and then hold others accountable with you, and then you make sure that you never forget that this is all about people, I think you have the foundation of what's really going to take us forward and to become the kind of leader that we need you to be. So the question is, what do we do with that? In 1989, my daughter was born. This is her at about age six. I was a very young father, probably too young, but I was uh, really, really smart. I knew exactly what was gonna happen Nothing was going to change. Pop the kid out, go right back to my normal everyday life. How big of a I mean, I wasn't even one having the baby, right? It's like, you know, whatever. Yeah, everyone laughing is a, is a parent, okay? <laughs> because that is about as far from the truth as you can possibly get. The minute my daughter was born, my identity changed. I stopped being just Charlie. I was dad. I was pops. Well, sometimes. I was protector. I was provider. I was sometimes adorer. I was sometimes disciplinarian. And my wife will accuse me of being idolizer. She says that my little princess gets away with anything. Completely not true, by the way. <laughs> but the point of it is, is, is that whenever you go through a transformation like this, you have to be willing to challenge your own sense of identity. Who are we as IT professionals, and I think we need to go into this with a new sense of what that is. Who are we? 
I promised you that there are four rules, and I believe fair ver try this again, four very specific roles that we as IT professionals are going to be playing in the future. This actually came out of a, of a lunch I had with a good CIO friend of mine who runs a large bio uh, IT organization for a, a, a life sciences firm. And we were talking in the context of CIOs, but I think that the truth is this applies to each and every one of us. There are four roles that we are going to be serving as we kind of put all these pieces together, the market forces, the new rules that are, that are kind of guiding what we're dealing with. And we're going to have to get very comfortable in these. And I'll warn you, these are really not about technology. The four roles that we're going to be serving, or the, the four roles that we'll be providing, are a little bit different. The first is that we're going to become a trend spotter. As that technology has moved outside of our walls, and things have become much more focused and specialized, then one of our primary jobs is going to be continuously scanning the horizon and looking for both opportunities and threats. One of the things in that McKinsey article that Catherine pointed out was this idea of disruptive technologies. They are a very clear threat to a lot of large organizations, but they also represent opportunities if we get in front of them. One of our jobs as IT leaders is going to be to scan that horizon in context of our unique situation to identify those trends and be able to bring them in a point of relevance to our organizations. So if I'm the golf course, that I'm looking for those technologies that may impact either from a risk standpoint or from an opportunity standpoint, those things around the actual playing of the game and the maintenance of the courses, et cetera. But for another company, perhaps even in the same line of business, that very same technology disruption may not represent an opportunity or a threat at all based on the strategic posture of the organization. So the days of us being kind of agnostic to an industry Long gone. I don't care if you're a DBA, a network engineer, whatever part of the IT profession you're in, you're going to have to understand your business intimately to serve in this role, to be able to spot those trends and to recognize, are they, in fact, a threat or an opportunity? The second role is to be negotiator and mediator. As again, if we have 80% of our technology outside of our walls and we are dealing in these really complex webs we can't simply demand that our suppliers, or for that matter, our customers act a certain way anymore. So we're going to have to become really good at negotiating and mediating. Now, by the way, there's an, there's an upside to this, because part of that is also going to exist within the walls of the enterprise. Sometimes I think we get ensconced in the world of IT that we forget, that there's all this other stuff going on, and that within the enterprise, guess what? They have all that other stuff that's happening, too. We need to recognize that we have a role to play here. And so you're going to have to learn how to play that role of helping bring people together to find solutions more effectively. The third is the information weaver. You may have huge chunks of the technology that are lying outside of your domain. Salesforce is a great example. We may decide that it's not strategic to our business, so we're going to let the VP of sales run Salesforce. That's fine. But that doesn't mean that the information that Salesforce has within it is, in, is not valuable to the rest of the organization. So the role of the IT leader is to harness and capture that information and to weave it into a mosaic that creates value for the broader enterprise. And the fourth role is that of the business process innovator. I believe we have to accept the fact that technology innovation is not going to happen inside the walls of the corporate enterprise. It hasn't really for the last five to 10 years at least. But that doesn't mean we're out of the business of innovation. It just means that our focus on innovation has to be on business process innovation. Procter & Gamble is widely reviewed as one of the most innovative companies in the world, and yet they make commodity products, soaps, things like that. It's because they innovate at a business process level, and that is our future. That we need to become very good at taking commoditized technologies, combining them with unique business processes to create competitive value for our organizations. And that's where our future is going to be. Okay, I'm running late. So here's where we need to take this. Those are the roles. Those are the kind of the, the, the four, three fours, right? But it's not as simple as knowing it. In fact, it almost never is. Knowing's not enough. We have to do something with this. And that's going to take a little something. In 1922, my great-grandfather left New Mexico, which is a state in the U.S., for California. He had a promise of a job with the train company if he could 
get there. So he left my great-grandmother and their daughters in New Mexico and went off. A few months later, she received a letter and said, gather up the girls, gather up everything we have, come to Los Angeles. Included just enough money for the trip. And so she set off, speaking not a word of English, being completely illiterate. Her daughters had to read the letter to her. And they showed up. They pulled in the train station, and there he was, as he'd promised. As she was telling the story to my father, with a tear in her eye, she said, but what if he hadn't been? What would I have done? It took a tremendous amount of faith and investment for them to set out towards a new future, to plot their course. That's what is going to be required of each of you. This is not a time to be tepid. This is not a time to wait and see. If you stand still, this opportunity will pass you by. So to move forward, it's going to take action on your part. You're going to have to be willing to invest in yourself enough to challenge your own identity enough, to set out to learn new skills, to adopt these roles enough so that you can enter this era, that you can lead us into this future. Okay, so what you've been handed is a little bracelet. If you haven't yet, please put it on. And hold your hand, stick it in, hold your hand up like this. And if, if your neighbor isn't doing this, you feel free to glare at them. It's okay. I think sometimes we feel that the idea of leadership is something, and I'll keep them up, we're going we're gonna to get there, hold on, yeah. Sometimes the idea, the idea of leadership is something that has to be given to us. That we have to be anointed as a leader. I'm here to tell you that we do not. But in case you feel that that's the case, I will do it for you. You are an IT leader. You are a catalyst for change in our industry. You have the power within you to change yourself, to change your organization, and to change everything about what it is that we do. Okay, you can put them down. Over the next three days, there is a wealth of information. I went through the the, the catalog of, of track sessions, I know many of the speakers, there is so much great information that is going to be presented to you over the next three days. And the challenge in front of you is that if you go into it the way you always have, it can be wasted. But if you go into it with an attitude that you are an IT leader and that you are collecting this information very specifically to use it to change how you, your organization, and our industry moves forward, then I think this conference can be transformative for you. So wear this bracelet, look at it, remember that you are an IT leader, and let's change the world of IT together. Thank you, Thank you very much, Charles. Don't, don't, don't go as yet. Uh, so when I come to conferences and I see keynotes, I want keynotes that actually challenge the way I think, make me feel a little bit different, and at the end, uh, change me a little bit. So thank you once again, Charles. Here's a, something for, uh, as appreciation. But don't go yet. There's more. <laughs> Late there's, night. There's something else for you to get you through the day. Now, Thanks. Charles was here. We got you to put your, your hands up, which was sort of a call to action. But Charles, I really don't think that was powerful enough because it was just, just about your session, where there's lots of transformational sessions that you'll have here today. Now, you talked about your daughter before. What's the most sacred promise a child can make? Wow. Oh, the, the pinky the promise? The pinky promise. It is the most powerful promise that anyone can make. So what I'd like everyone to do just briefly, and Charles and I will do it, because what I really want you to not only take away from today that you'll do something, but from the next session, the session afterwards, and when you go back to work, you'll implement some of these things. So what I'd like you all to do is stand up. Come on, guys.
Stand up. And what I want you to do is to your neighbor and find someone, I want you to have a pinky promise with them that you will take something away from this and implement it. Charles, we'll take something away and implement it. All right. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone.